Hi, I'm John Schwartz, Dean of the College of Public Service at the University of Houston downtown. Welcome to our Social Work Persons of the Year celebration. Uh, I wanna just say a few things about University of Houston downtown. We are the second largest university in Houston, fourth largest city in the country. We are the most diverse university, not only in Texas, but in the Southern region. We're very proud to be at University of Houston downtown and to be in the College of uh, Public Service. We're especially proud of our social work program. Not only is it one of the fastest growing programs at the University of Houston downtown, but it's making a real difference in our community and beyond. We're training practitioners who are working in all kinds of social work settings and our amazing social work faculty are doing research and practice that makes a real difference in Houston. I'm always thrilled that this event, it's one of my favorite events of the year because we honor amazing individuals in our community. And we're honoring two individuals who are making a real difference in public health, not only in our country, but globally. So it's an amazing event. So I'm gonna, without further ado, pass it over to our amazing head of, director of our social work department, Dr. Don McCarty. Thank you so much, Dean Swords. Thank you everyone. Welcome to our 11th annual social work program, Person of the Year celebration. Every year, the UHD Bachelor of Social Work program goes through a formal process of nominating and selecting a person of the year. This year, we are happy to honor co-recipients for our award. As a social work program situated in a college of public service, we are witness to acts of kindness, compassion, and service to our community almost daily. It is a great gift and an honor to be a public servant, and in particular to train the next generation to elevate our efforts. This award was developed to honor persons that rise to the highest levels of service for the common good. Past awardees include Dr. Dave Buck, founder of Houston Healthcare for the Homeless, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Lisa Falkenberg, humanitarian Mattress Mack, former Harris County Clerk Chris Hollins, and our own mayor, Sylvester Turner, among others, each one honored for creating critical structures and opportunity for opening doors for many people to survive and thrive in our community. Our awardees for this year raise this bar on so many levels. In these COVID-19 times, they have done something extraordinary for the common good in their development in particular of a vaccine that is patent free and thus accessible and affordable worldwide. We're excited this evening to hear more about the story of their historic accomplishment and to honor this great global justice achievement. I'd like to introduce our our Head of Ceremonies, Master of Ceremonies for the evening, Dr. Dana Smith, Assistant Professor of Social Work and Director of the BSW Department. Take it away, Dr. Smith. Thank you, Dr. McCarty. Everyone, I have the pleasure of introducing our honorees tonight. Dr. Peter Hotez is Dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine at Baylor College of Medicine and Professor in the Departments of Pediatrics, and Molecular Virology and Bi Microbiology, and Endowed Chair in Tropical Pediatrics at Texas Children's Hospital. Um, he earned a Bachelor of Arts degree from Yale University, PhD from the Rockefeller University, and a doctorate in medicine from Weill Cornell Medical College, where his dissertation and postdoctoral training focused on hookworm, molecular pathogenesis, and vaccine development. He is also the co-director of Parasites Without Borders, a global nonprofit organization with a focus on those suffering from parasitic diseases in subtropical environments. I, like many others, leaned on the words of Dr. Hotez early in the pandemic when we were longing for answers. He explained things in a way that helped those of us, which is most of us who are not medical scientists, understand what COVID-19 was all about and what we should do and expect. His commitment to helping our community understand how to respond to the pandemic has been tremendous. Dr. Maria Elena Botazzi is Associate Dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine at Baylor College of Medicine, 
and professor in the departments of pediatrics and molecular virology and microbiology as well. She co-directs Texas Children's Hospital Center for Vaccine Development um, <clears throat> and is distinguished professor of biology at Baylor University. She is the editor-in-chief of Current Tropical Medicine Reports. She earned a bachelor's degree in microbiology from the National Autonomous University of Honduras and a doctor of philosophy degree from the University of Florida. She completed postdoctoral fellowships at the University of Pennsylvania and the University of Miami Hospital and Clinics. Most notably today, our distinguished honorees, as Dr. McCarty so ably put it, led a team at Texas Children's and Baylor to develop a patent-free vaccine, which has been described by many as the world's COVID vaccine. It can be produced for about $2, I understand, and can be administered just about anywhere. About a week after our team came together and decided that we absolutely would name them as Social Work Persons of the Year, they were also nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. Because of their selfless work to provide humanitarian aid in the form of an accessible COVID vaccine to the far corners of the world, they have been named our 2021 Social Work Persons of the Year. So without further ado, we will now hear from Dr. Peter Hotez and Dr. Maria Elena Botazzi. Well, thank you very much. Um, I guess, Mary Elena, I'll, I'll start out, say a few words, and then, then you say a few words. It's hard for us to both talk simultaneously, although since we've been finishing each other's sentences for 20 years, I think we could probably do that as well. But uh, Mary Elena and I have worked together now for two decades um, with this vision uh, to create a research and development center that would make the vaccines that the big pharma companies would not make either because they couldn't, because there was no way to ensure that they would raise money for their shareholders or they didn't have the interest. And so we began on this quest to uh, develop vaccines for poverty-related parasitic disease diseases, such as conditions that most people don't, do not know about in the United States, but which are huge scourges uh, globally. They include uh, conditions such as female genital schistosomiasis, uh, one of the most common gynecologic conditions of girls and women living in extreme poverty on the African continent, the cause of terrible pain and bleeding and social stigma, hookworm disease, a huge cause of anemia, especially during pregnancy, when it combines with malaria on the African continent, a huge disease that's present in the Latin American region and now here in Texas called Chagas disease or mal de Chagas, uh, which is another parasitic infection that causes heart disease in up to six to seven million people in Latin America and now, now here in Texas uh, as well. And so we've made a lot of progress in, in developing those vaccines. And our approach has always been to say, look, um, the pharma companies are not likely going to be interested in scaling up and producing them, but you know, there is capacity for making vaccines in many low and middle income countries. So countries such as Vietnam and Bangladesh and India and Indonesia and Argentina and Brazil and Cuba, uh, all you have a technology that's used to make the recombinant hepatitis B vaccine. So those countries all make their own re recombinant hepatitis B vaccine. And it's done through a process known as microbial fermentation in yeast. It actually makes vegan vaccines, vaccines with no human cells or animal cells, human proteins or animal proteins. So we thought, look, if we can make our vaccines with that technology or similar technology, then it could plug and play and be made locally in many low and many low and middle income countries. And over the years, we've been partnering with Brazil and Mexico um, for that purpose and, and Malaysia as well. And then about oh, 10 years ago, we started developing coronavirus vaccines because at that time, 10 years ago, 11 years ago, nobody cared about coronavirus vaccines. We knew they were going to be important. Uh, but they were orphans, so we used that same approach and developed vaccines for SARS, severe acute respiratory syndrome, that arose out of uh, southern China in 2002, and then MERS, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, that arose out of the Arabian Peninsula um, uh, around that time, and, and that's when I served as U.S. Science Envoy in the Obama administration, helping with those efforts. 
And then when the COVID-19 sequence came along, we looked at it, we looked at each other and said, we could do this because we've already made vaccines like this for SARS and MERS. We could turn around for COVID and our team of 20 plus scientists got special permission early on in the pandemic to work in the labs because if you remember, everything was kind of shut down uh, at that time. And, and the team worked diligently under under a lot of duress because it was a scary time to be around other people at that time. We had no vaccines and no and no, no protection other than masks and other, other PPE. But we worked hard and we were able to develop a prototype vaccine, which we then transferred the technology um, with no patent uh, to, um, because as I often like to say, when your house is on fire, you don't call the patent attorney, you call the fire department. We wanted to be the fire department. And we transferred that technology to four countries, to India, Indonesia, Bangladesh, and ultimately Botswana, because they had vaccine producers there that were interested in our technology to make the vaccine. And we transferred that technology first to a, a vaccine producer known as Biological E in India, and um, they were an extraordinary group of scientists. So Mary Elaine and I were um, on Zoom calls early in the morning uh, until late at night. And, uh, and because when, you're, when you work with, as anyone knows, if you collaborate with anybody in Asia, that, that's what usually that means. So uh, I still remember with fondness, all the, Mary Elaine would usually get up first and she would text me or call me at 4.30 in the morning or 5 in the morning. And that's how our day started because we had to be on a call with a Zoom call with Indonesia or India or, or late at night. And of course, the other complexity, Mar Mary Elena was talking to all of Latin America to, to advise them through their COVID pandemic, just like I was talking on the cable news channels uh, here in the United States. But we got it done and transferred the technology and now uh, India has uh, produced 300 million doses of the vaccine, and uh, as of last last week, 1.8 million kids over the age of 12 uh, got this vaccine in India, where it's known as Corbivax. Uh, so that was a very gratifying moment when we saw that kids were actually getting vaccinated um, with the vaccine developed to Texas children. So that that's that's the story. And the other than to say. Um, this would not have happened if we had not come to Texas and Houston because of this extraordinary Texas Medical Center. Um, I like telling the story that um, when I, you know, when you go on the cable news channels here in, in the U.S., um, they don't always portray Texas in the best light. And I would love to tell the story about how we we actually came to Texas because of um, its its ability to innovate and have extraordinary institutions like the University of Houston downtown and the Texas Medical Center. And as the, as, as the dean points out, with an extraordinary level of diversity, and that's very much true of our research laboratory as well. So we came here to Texas to actually up our, up our game scientifically. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's an important story for people to hear that, that Houston and Texas is a very special place. Uh, because of its commitment to innovation and also philanthropy, because initially we got kind of shut out of uh, Operation Warp Speed support because we weren't a pharma company. And but we relied heavily on philanthropy here in Texas to get us over that hump in order to transfer the technology. So it's incredibly gratifying and very satisfying. And as I often say, if it wasn't for being here in Houston and, and being here in the state of Texas, I, I, I doubt this would have happened. So. Let me stop there and, and, and see what Mary Elena has to say. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And um, thanks, Dean Schwartz and Dr. Marcardi and Dr. Smith for the um, very nice introduction. So let me actually flip la tortilla, uh, tell you the other side of the, of the coin in the story. Um, so I'm, as you uh, mentioned, I am a um, Hispanic, uh, scientist uh, trained in Honduras uh, with roots, Italian roots, um, and now, you know, proud uh, Houstonian. So as you can see, and again, you know, uh, reflecting on the initial words from Dean Schwartz, you know, diversity is very important. 
but also um, this this award that you all are giving us, it's it's very special because it really touches upon the true definition of of servant leadership, um, and I think that is um, a, an aspect that I have been learning and 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 building alongside Peter for the last twenty years um, in its true sense, um, and it comes from not only scientifically seeing how diseases such as neglected diseases, the diseases of poverty are causing so much um, lives uh, that are lost or lives that are lived uh, with a lot of disability. So, so you, you understand very well what that, what, what that means, uh, you know, especially in, in, in the area of, of social work when you have to really see the suffering that poverty brings, the suffering of not having um, access to health, not having um, a, a access to education, but that ultimately all that really reflects on how a community strives, a community can prosper, because everything, unfortunately, in this world also brings that branding of, of, of what's the economic productivity of an individual or, or, or a community. And so that's why when I uh, was studying in Honduras, and I was seeing, because Honduras has many of these problems, uh, especially the, the, the cycle of poverty, I was trying to find what could eventually be my calling uh, in life, um, always attracted certainly to science, uh, but also very interested about how can you transform science with business practices, right? With the way that we operate, you know, to, to really um, extend this concept of what does it really mean to be productive and, 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 and to create a framework. And I think the combination of the fact that I do come from a family of diplomats, but also um, after meeting Peter and seeing that he had the same philosophy of how do you serve and how do you really think of what the work that you do in our laboratories, but ultimately with the, the, the end at the, the, the end in our mind, right, of who is going to be the beneficiary, which, which are all these poor people, really allowed us to do this intersection between, you know, how do you really do good science, good reproducible, strong, you know, and, and robust science, but um, enabling it to be um, transferred, enabling it to be um, reproduced, and to really strengthen, you know, that ecosystem uh, abroad, so that you know people can, you know, as resilient as they may be, that they can really provide solutions for their own problems. Um, and so, for me, uh, it's 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 been a, a, an amazing ride um, to be with Peter, you know, for eleven years in certainly the DC area, now almost eleven years here. But then, when I arrived to Houston which I have to say I'm like in, in my own backyard, right? You know, Houston at some level has not much of a difference compared to communities in Latin America and, and certainly with Honduras. You know, we are very diverse, but, you know, we have, you know, a lot of inequities um, uh, and a lot of uh, disadvantage, you know, populations even just, you know, around the corner and, and seeing, however, at the same time, the power of, of, of Texas, right? You know, that everything in Texas is, is, is audacious and it's big. I started really learning a lot more about our community. I know that you mentioned various of your award, prior IWRDs. Many of them also are um, transformational leaders in that, with the true sense of, you know, what, what it means to be a servant leader. And that really requires that you have, you know, a, a, a couple of characteristics, right? So the first characteristic, um, to believe in ourselves, you know, and I can tell this to also the, all the, all the women and all the, 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 the young girls that, you know, are listening to this, you know, you have to have your, you have to believe in yourself. But more than that is, once you believe in yourself, you have the power of creativity and from Peter, I learned that, you know, it's not enough to, to believe in yourself and, and, and have creativity, but to have moral courage because you can fail almost daily and, um, and, and you have to just stand up and continue. 
And I think that's what we have uh, created with our vaccine center, with our school, with our division of tropical medicine. It's, it's that creativity with courage that ultimately then brings together collaboration, brings compassion, um, and ultimately that cultural intelligence that we all come from so many different walks of life and that the reason is ultimately to be public servants. And, and there are ways of doing this by being transparent, um, collaborative, and teaching others to be resilient and be able to uh, find their own solutions. And I think we are just beyond privileged to be here with you, to accept this honor and promise you, I think I can you know, say this on be both of our behalves, is promise you that we are continuing to be courageous and as, as much as we've seen this COVID-19 vaccine have already some amazing impact, as Peter said, in India, that we are not going to stop there, that we're going to, you know, encourage our partners to, you know, um, bring this vaccine to the last corner around the world that really needs it to benefit as many children, uh, young adults, and, and, and uh, the adult and elderly population around the world so that we can really stop this pandemic. But we're not going to stop there. As you know, we uh, are also very interested in looking now at what, what's coming next. Um, is there going to be another potential coronavirus in the future? And how can we then bridge this uh, break of the paradigm of how we did this work to give a push to our neglected disease vaccines and have them certainly advance to the point where, as Peter said, can come and solve all the burden of um, uh, genital schistosomiasis, intestinal parasites that are really um, pretty much um, eating the, 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 the life of our kids by, you know, uh, using all their the nutrition to remove the capacity of these kids to eventually grow, to be productive in society and, and be, become the next group of servant leaders that we really need to make sure that this world um, doesn't destroy itself for, by the hands of the humans. So thank you very much again. And I send it back to you, Dr. Smith. Thank you so very much. Oh my gosh, what powerful words each of you have shared with us and just such great information about your work. And, um, you know, some of us just go along every day through life, just not even realizing how people like you are doing such work to make sure that we can be safe, to make sure that we can be healthy, to make sure that our kids are taken care of. Um, it just amazes me. I mean, who thinks about, um, you know, uh, bio, uh, micro, uh, microbiology or uh, microbes on a daily basis. You do. And we appreciate it. Thank you so much for that. Um, we're going to um, have our Q&A right now. So those of you who are with us, I think we have at least 75 or so folks that are with us, maybe more at this time. If you would please um, put your notes in the, put some um, in the Q&A, go ahead and put any questions that you may have. And we're going to ask a few questions um, of our honored guests today. And I'll start that off. So I'll ask a couple questions while you all are getting your questions in the Q&A area there for us. All right. So um, I'll just start here with um, Dr. Potazi. You mentioned something about create, um, creativity and courage. And that was really um, it, that, that really struck me because you know, I think about courage, but I don't think about creativity and courage. And I'd love for you to say a little bit more about that. Um, we have students here that are just kind of figuring out what their calling is. And they want to be servants. They are servants. They're in public service. But just kind of thinking about the fact that they will hit some bumps in the road and having that courage and, and having creativity with that courage, I think, could be really helpful. Do you have any other things that you'd like to share or add to that? Yes, absolutely. And, and again, maybe I can use even some personal examples of, of what, what I mean. It's, it's, you know, like I, for example, um, knew I wanted to uh, have a life in science and therefore I, you know, I was very interested in microbiology. Uh, but, but very rapidly, I realized that especially when you want to work on uh, diseases that 
many people maybe not even have heard of, or like Peter said, there's not that urgency uh, for one reason or another. And then I realized that you need to change the way that we we did we did our business, right? So in two ways. One, by expanding outside of science and, and uh, acquiring skills that were not necessarily um, the skills that I would have thought I would I would would have needed, right? So two, one, I finally realized that as much as I love science, for you to implement good science, you also have to learn at some level some skills of business practices, right? Management, organizational behavior, finances, of course, the economics, um, the legal framework. And so I think my aha moment came when I was um, at, Penn, at Penn, at the University of Pennsylvania. I was finishing my postdoc and I was a little bit in, you know, uh, frustrated because I really didn't know how I would see myself in my scientific path. And, and I decided to just randomly open the horizons of my mind. And I, as a hobby, ultimately, went into a, a business degree at Temple University. And, and rapidly, I realized that my professors were all coming from the pharmaceutical sector. So I said, hmm, so you can do the business of science. And then later on, after meeting Peter, I said, okay, but how do I communicate that inter interaction between science business? I need to learn how to speak about it and speak about it not in very sophisticated, complicated terms. And I think that's what it means, this, this combination of courage and creativity is, as I saw myself struggling in making the decisions of that I wanted to be a microbiologist. I wanted to work in the space of um, infectious tropical diseases, diseases of the poor that I knew I was going to struggle um, convincing, you know, the importance of these. I really came up, come up with this creativity of, I need to diversify my knowledge. I need to diversify the way that I speak. And so that's, that's an example of, of combining that, you know, once you feel that you have, you're struggling with something, there's always some experience that clicks that creativity and makes you try to find a, a way out and therefore, you know, find a, a suitable uh, alternative pathway, right? That complements what you, what, you, what you want or what you like. Very nice. Thank you so much for that. We have received quite a few questions just in that little bit of time. And so um, I'll try to get to as many of them as we can. This first one that I have here is from one of our professors, um, Dr. Heather Goltz, and she says, Drs. Hotez and Botazi, first, thank you so much for showing the world that social and economic justice principles can be embedded into medical research and create sea change. I followed your work throughout the pandemic and know that your work has made you the focus of anti-vaccination and even hate groups. What advice do you have for future scientists and social workers when they face this kind of opposition? Um, well, maybe I'll start. Um, and, and I think that's right. This, is, this has been an unfolding story for the last two decades, actually. And, and it, but it's been around for 20 years, this, what I, I don't even call it misinformation or disinformation anymore. I call it anti-science aggression. And it's evolved from grassroots organizations that claim that vaccines cause autism to something much larger, better organized, better funded, and more nefarious. Um, I got involved in it because I like to write books. And one of the books that I wrote was um, about my daughter, Rachel, and it was called Vaccines Did Not Cause Rachel's Autism, because that was the original assertion. They claimed that vaccines cause autism. I have four adult kids, including Rachel, who lives with us here in Montrose and She's an adult now, a 30-year-old, and then has autism and intellectual disabilities and wrote the book explaining why there's no link in the science of vaccines, but also the science of autism and the genetic and epigenetic basis of autism. And I thought that was kind of the end of it, but it really unleashed a torrent of uh, anti-vaccine aggression against me and my family. And it's taken on a new dimension here in this time of COVID-19. Uh, intuitively, you would have thought, well, when people clamoring for a COVID-19 vaccine, um, this would melt away, but it actually emboldened the anti-vaccine groups. And 
it caused them to take on a new dimension, which is to become a political dimension. And it linked itself to political extremism on the far right. And this is very hard for scientists to talk about because all of our training says we don't talk about Republicans and Democrats and liberals or conservatives, but this is the reality that it linked to um, far right groups. So now you have the Proud Boys, for instance, marching at anti-vaccine demonstrations in Washington, DC. And you're seeing this play out um, with far right members of the of Congress. So now I have, you know, people like Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene, who's a very far right um, a member of Congress from Georgia, go on Steve Bannon's war room podcast and attack scientists, including myself, or I've had Fox News go after me on three successive nights a couple of weeks ago. And it's so it's a very unsettling uh, time. And, um, and the point is, it's no longer just an academic discussion, because it's translating into loss of life. So over um, since last May, May of 2021, beginning with the Delta wave that cut across Texas and the Southern United States. I estimate at least 200,000 unvaccinated Americans lost their lives to COVID-19, even though vaccines were widely available and did it because of defiance and refusal to get vaccinated. I mean, um, because they believe the messages coming out of the CPAC conference, the conservative, the far right conservative conference that said, Vaccines are just political instruments of control or first they're going to vaccinate you and then they're going to take away your guns and your Bibles. And as ridiculous as that sounds to us, there's a quarter of the country that that believed it. And people responded by refusing to get vaccinated. And it's caused a massive loss of life, um, uh, almost as much as COVID itself. And so when you think about all of the things that we, big social forces that we work hard to combat, like terrorism or violence or or um, uh, or cyber attacks or even nuclear proliferation anti-science as I call it is a, is a bigger killer than all those things combined I mean 200,000 Americans a massive loss in life so um, what do we do about it uh, well I think you know the pro- part of the problem is scientists, are not really equipped to know how to do the public engagement and communicate. And that vacuum is allowed anti-vaccine, anti-science forces to come in. So I think one of the messages for medical training and scientific training, and, and I would argue now for, for a school of social work as well, is to recognize that we can't allow all our communication to be filtered through journalists. We as professionals, whether we're in social work or medicine or science, have to be prepared to be out there in the public domain and communicating and talking to groups. And that's a skill that doesn't come naturally. I mean, I had to learn about trial and error, more error than trial, unfortunately, but uh, uh, but there is a way to do that. So, and, and it's hard to change that culture because I think many university offices of communications don't necessarily like their faculty and students speaking out. They want to control the message. and. And it's not working. And I think we have to find a way. Not everybody wants to do that public engagement, but there's a subset, especially of young people who are committed to public service, do want to do that. We have to give them that option, give them the freedom to be out there communicating to the public, writing opinion pieces, op-eds, commentary pieces, uh, being having freedom to be out there on social media, expressing views, because we've learned the consequences of not doing it and some very negative forces come in. So there's going to have to be a change in the ecosystem to prevent um, a recurrence of of what's happened. And unfortunately now anti-science, anti-vaccine groups have only gotten more emboldened and are stronger and more powerful than ever. And and I'm working now on a new book because I like to write books and it's got the working title, Anti-Science Kills, that really tells the story about how so many Americans have needlessly lost their lives just over the last 10 months. So let me stop there. Comment from one of our participants today. She says, my daughter is medically complex and goes to TCH for most of her specialties, including cardiology. As soon as I learned about your new vaccine, I really wanted her and her twin brother to get the vaccine you created. 
because I truly trust TCH with all my heart. Both of you really made a lot of Houstonians proud. Thank you. Thank you. And then we, we have another question here. Oh, by the way, so Mary Lane and I get emails every day asking for our vaccine. So I'll leave it to Mary Lane and explain why that's not happening here in the U.S. yet. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's complex. I mean, we, we, we still have the hope that it may eventually come to the United States. But, but to be very honest, when we had to uh, pick the, the, the philosophy, this model, right, we knew that there was going to be a big gap in access uh, in the low middle income country setting. And so our priority was to enable this transfer of technology uh, to producers that could then um, get that authorization to be used in the low middle income country settings. While at the same time, um, the unfortunate that we never could find a, a partner to produce the vaccine in the United States, we still are hopeful maybe uh, there is someone that would get incentivized to produce our vaccine here, um, but uh, they were all a little bit distracted with, you know, these uh, new technologies, which thankfully work. Uh, and certainly many of us uh, have the fortunate of being beneficiaries uh, for um, uh, using the RNA vaccines or the J&J &J vaccine. So I think in, uh, we wish we could bring it tomorrow to, to, to here to the U.S. as potentially to many other countries. But we still have hopes. I mean, I wouldn't, I would never say never. <laughs> Thank you so much. So another question is, with the understanding that viruses weaken, that a virus weakens when it mutates, are the current strains still powerful enough that it may cause you to reformulate the vaccine? You know, that is a very um, interesting question because you're right. You know, we as scientists have to always be a little bit futuristic, right? You know, thinking again, what is gonna happen next? Um, this notion of how um, um, much you have to either reformulate or, or make second generations, or certainly we're always looking to improve um, the vaccine, make them of course more durable, more uh, universal. You know, that is an aspiration that we definitely have, um, whether it's for, the um, SARS-2 family um, or the overall, what we call the Sarbico family, which are all the SARS-1, SARS-2, and even there's a third lineage. Um, I think that is the, ultimately the goal. And there's multiple ways of how you do that. But at the end of the day, it does require for us to be very attentive of how not only this virus, the SARS-2 virus is changing and modifying, uh, looking historically how SARS um, became and left and how MERS came and left, and but how we have so many other um, uh, coronaviruses in, uh, in the veterinary uh, arena. So I think that, you know, you're absolutely right. I think that is where we scientists have to now continue working to determine how we can improve the vaccines, um, uh, such that we can, of course, uh, bring um, value and we can prevent that these changes in these viruses don't um, uh, lose the, the, uh, the, the ability of our body to, to protect ourselves because we were either vaccinated with a, a, a different uh, um, prior generation of the vaccine. And I think that is very common to do. So, yes, we are doing some... Uh, um, Reevaluation of how the formulations should look like. And I think you're going to start seeing it hopefully with more of these combining and doing these boosting strategies, not with the same vaccine, but with combining. Like, for example, our vaccine um, would be ideal, right? Ideal to boost someone who already got an RNA or someone who already got a J&J a &J or, or an AstraZeneca or someone who got a whole inactivated virus vaccine. Um, Protein-based vaccines have some very interesting characteristics that historically have seen that are very good uh, booster strategies. And we now know that potentially they broaden the response and they make it possibly even more durable and longer term. So a lot of promise also for this uh, very simple technology that maybe pe people at the beginning neglected, 
but now hopefully it will um maybe it's the, the last the last man standing at the end of the day we'll see what will happen in the in the future thank you so we have a question here where someone's at saying that those with moral courage resolve to do the right things even if it puts them at personal danger and risks as was the case with coronavirus how did you overcome or what state of mind did you have to face to face this unknown and unpredictable pandemic well you know you know it was very tough especially um during the early days of the pandemic in, in early 2020 because i was going on um uh, the the cable news channels and at that time we were struggling to raise money for the vaccine and nobody was very interested because everyone was so focused on mrna it was a very tough time but the hard part came in march and april when you started to see the white house um in 2020 you know basically downplay the significance of the pandemic and say that covid was a hoax or that the hospital admissions were just due to catch up admissions and and um spectacularizing hydroxychloroquine and the list went on and on and i i remember you know talking to my wife ann and i said you know this i know what this is i mean because not because I'm so brilliant, but because I've been going up against anti-vaccine groups for so many years. I said, this is a, this is a classic playbook for the, an anti-science disinformation campaign. What do I do? And she said, well, you know, and usually she's, usually I'm the unfiltered one and, and you know, sort of holds me back. And she says, well, you know, don't say that. And this time she was quite the opposite. She said, if you don't say something, you don't want to wake up six months or a year from now and see oh, so many people losing their lives from COVID and realize you could have said something to stop it. And that's all I needed to hear. And I called it out as, a, as I was one of the first to call it out as an anti-science disinformation campaign coming out of the White House. And, and again, not because I'm so brilliant, but because I'd been going up against it for so long, I became an expert not only in vaccine science, but also the anti-science. And that was very tough because it had um, an immediate backlash um, from far right groups. And that's when the hate emails um, really revved up. And, you know, they would say the army of patriots is going to hunt me down and, and that sort of thing and how to bring in the Houston Police Department. And they knew I was Jewish. So there was a lot of anti-Semitism attached to it and I had to bring in the Anti-Defamation anti League to help me. But that was a very tough time, and I'm still dealing with the aftermath of that. But, you know, there are certain times when you have to uh, take a stand. And, and it's not because I wanted to politicize it. They were politicizing COVID-19 and vaccines. And my point was, look, you're entitled to your views, even if they're extreme conservative views. I don't have an issue with that. But, what I, but my point was, don't adopt this stuff. Don't adopt the anti-science because it's a killer. And, and that's the battle that I've been fighting uh, ever since. Maybe I can just add from, from my perspective, uh, the fact that Peter was dealing with, with, with that struggle while at the same time we were dealing that even within our own scientific community, they kept, they kept really... Um, highlighting how our um, vision of using a conventional technology, something that we even had a lot of data, like really a lot of even published data, how they were really trying to downplay it and how at some level they were disparaging, you know, the, the, our intent of, of, of like, you know, that's just never going to work. You know, you're, you know, you're totally wasting your time. You know, and, and, and that really discourages, you know, not only us, uh, but our team, right? Because every time we would say, look, you know, we are doing this and we are going to stay solid in our, um, in our objective, while at the same time you're hearing from prominent, you know, scientific community not believing that it would even work. And then slowly seeing how very luckily with our partners in India and, and, and the other producers that they, they, they didn't fall for that, uh, um, 
that co- that type of uh, 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 I guess uh, you know counter countering the, the fact that protein based that you know a simple technology would work um, and seeing as so the results were being positive and positive but at the same time seeing how even if when the results were positive and positive the goalposts kept moving up farther and farther and even to today I have to say there are many who still are still not believing on um, the value of bringing a uh, affordable, highly scalable, safe, acceptable, um, even uh, trusted uh, technology to many countries around the world. And so that I think reminds us that you know you you just have to continue, continue, continue. If you believe in something, you have to continue. There's the old um, expression that's sometimes attributed to Gandhi, but someone told me, no, Gandhi didn't actually say that. It was somebody else. I forget who, but it goes something like this. Um, first, they ignore you. Then they laugh at you. Um, then they rise up against you. And then you win. Uh, and so I think that that pretty much summarizes what happened with our COVID-19 vaccine. Our, our Churchill said, um, uh, success is not final uh, failure is not fatal it's the courage to persevere that really carries the day and i and i think that that's really very much true it's it's resilience and perseverance are such important qualities not only for science and medicine but for social work and any kind of public service thank you both thank you very much i love both of the i love those quotes too dr hotez those are perfect um so we have a question here. Do you feel that the coronavirus will be here to stay? And will we need yearly vaccines depending on the most virulent strain of it, similar, similar to the yearly flu vaccine? I, I think it all depends on if we can get our vaccine out and vaccinate the world. I mean, Mother Nature is telling us, you know, she's not being coy with us. She's telling exactly what where she's going to do. She told us that if we don't vaccinate the world, she's gonna continue to hurl variants of concerns at us. So she she gave us the Delta variant out of an unvaccinated population in India around this year last time that was devastating. And then Omicron and now the BA2 subvariant out of an unvaccinated population in Southern Africa. And as long as we hold back and not vaccinate the world's low and middle income countries in Africa, Asia and Latin America, we're going to deal with these new variants of concern. So it's up to us. It's up to us whether we want to halt the pandemic. And that means vaccinating the world. And that's why we're so passionate about moving this forward and vaccinating the world. And maybe to add to that, you know, this concept of, you know, how often, how many, you know, um, it again, it depends on how quickly we can vaccinate the places where they have not received any vaccine. And that will determine how much virus are we going to be able to block. So we still have, we still have hopes that this year, maybe we can really see a, 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 an impact. So stay tuned. But in the meantime, I, I still am a firm believer that, you know, besides having the privilege of getting vaccines and having access to vaccines here, we should still be a little bit more cautious with other other tools to to attempt to prevent you know reinfections or infections you never really know also what is going to be the long sequelae of you know of, of not only infect being infected once but maybe even multiple infections so there's many things we still do not know about this virus there's so much so much to to learn and we appreciate you all being on the forefront because we expect that as you learn more about this virus, you're definitely going to um, educate us. Um, so I have a lo- kind of a logistics question. I spent some time thinking about um, the Pfizer vaccine and, and at first how it had to be refrigerated and so forth. And I know that those protocols have changed a little bit. And then with the Moderna vaccine having to be refrigerated. And I remember hearing in the news that um, one of th- there were some certain countries that did not care to... Um, purchase or have either of those vaccines because they just didn't have the means to get the vaccine out into remote areas because they didn't have the equipment to make sure that the vaccine would maintain its efficacy. And so I'm curious about with your vaccine, 
what does that require? For example, can it be carried, you know, in an ice chest out into a remote village and be given to people who might not be in a, a city where there's more equipment or a medical center to administer the vaccine? Well, so, yeah, go ahead, Peter. No, go ahead. So, yes, you, you're absolutely right. And, and, and in fact, it was even more... Um, more critical, the fact that the RNA vaccines, certainly at the beginning, required ultra cold freezing temperatures, not necessarily even just refrigeration. And beyond being freezing temperatures, there's also this concept of um, manipulation or, or um, like compounding, right? That you still needed to process it before you can get it uh, immunized or, or get it into the arm of, a, of an individual. So it was a pretty big struggle, in addition to the fact that, you know, it was very expensive. So many countries said, you know, we don't even have the money to buy them. But, you know, even if they come, we don't really have the cold chain requirements, not even to keep them in, in the capital cities. Imagine then trying to, you know, have people come to the city instead of us going with the vaccine. I know it's it's getting better and it's improving. But again, that is there for the value of the conventional platforms such as our recombinant protein technology, protein-based vaccines. Yes, they require refrigeration, so the common, you know, refrigerated temperature. But you're right; you can transport them in 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 boxes with cold packs. Uh, but at the same time, they generally tend to have what we call these stability profiles. That even if you go beyond the two to eight degrees, you know, they're still pretty stable. So you have windows and you have um, more, um, a, 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 a larger um, temperature range that you can keep them. And then the other thing too, is that because we know how to work with them for many years, they also can store, be stored for a long time. Some of these um, RNA vaccines or these new technologies, they would produce them, but they had to be used immediately, right, you know, in, in the next month or in the next three months. Um, Protein-based vaccines, you can make them. We, for example, have vaccines that we have had stored for five years, six years, seven years, and they're still, you know, solid and, and of good quality because they they retain that capacity of storage. Um, so a lot of advantages of these conventional technologies. Peter, what were you going to say? No, I was going to say the same thing. Absolutely. Okay, so I think I have a question here. Give me one second. I think I lost it. Let me find it again. Okay. Um, what tips do you have for people that are trying to do good work but need financial philanthropic support to carry it out? Well, that's that's life in the nonprofit world. We do need our we do need our. Um, our donors, our funders, our, our, uh, our philanthropy. And that's one of the blessings of Houston is that it is such a philanthropic uh, community. And that, in, and if you, especially if you lead it, the higher you go up in a nonprofit organization, the more important that becomes. And it's, it's not easy. It's exhausting. And on the other hand, you have to be the kind of person that feels, um, energized by explaining the mission and being excited by the mission of, of your organization. And it actually helps make you a better leader and, and helps you think things through because there's nothing like putting down your ideas on a piece of paper and explaining to a donor of what you want to do that helps solidify in your own mind. So I think the key is to recognize that, you know, raising funds, or supporting it is not, um, it should not be viewed as an onerous task, but there should be some joy in it as, as well, because it's an opportunity that where you can really share your enthusiasm with, with somebody else. And, and as I, I keep on emphasizing, you know, if we hadn't come to Houston, uh, we would not have made this vaccine or, or Texas. It's through, because this is a very giving and philanthropic community. And it's something very special about Houston that people like hearing about new ideas. And uh, I like to say, and people are always astonished when I say this back East, that you know, the Houstonians as a whole tend to be the most intellectually curious group of people I've ever had the opportunity to be with. And partly because 
so few of us are actually from Houston. We're all somewhere else and we all came to Houston or Texas to do big things. And so people love hearing about what you're doing. And, and so be, so, and, and the other thing about this part of the country and the Gulf coast is people are storytellers. Mm -hmm. So, so have fun and tell your story and, and, and have some joy in doing it. And, and the money, the money does come. It's, it's never enough. It's never what you fully need, but, but, you can get started and you can get, you can get work done. And Houston is still a place where if you're willing to work hard and have a good idea and a dream, um, it could come true. And this is, it's, it's, it's one of the last places left in the United States. I think where you can still pursue that old fashioned idea of the American dream. It's, it's a journey towards trust and it's a journey that ultimately has to be deeply meaningful, right? Deeply meaningful are the way that you tell your story and, 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 and deeply meaningful because it has to touch, of course, the, the donor or eventually the, the person that you, you know, that, that you, you're engaging. So it, it's, it goes both ways, right? The way that your story is important for you. You know, I, I think we learn to, to, to create that trust, that loyalty, that, you know, show the commitment, but ultimately it has to also be deeply meaningful for them and, and that it touches some part of their story. So I think it's, again, it's, it's just a conversation that needs to, to be, to be, to be certainly add water and see it grow. And some of, some of the plants grow slower <laughs> and, and, but eventually when the plant flourishes, you know, it can go for a long, 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 sustainable time, right? Just about three minutes. So we want to try to close on time, but I'm going to try to squeeze in one last question. If you all, if each of you can just tell us very briefly, what do you do for self-care? That's really important to us in social work and you're doing such hard work. Um, and with the discouragement you've experienced and the pressure on you, can you just quickly tell us what you do for self-care? Okay, so I can start. So I, first of all, try to um, connect with my family as much as I can, right? So to have that family connection, um, try to be mindful uh, and you know, do a little bit of inner reflection. So, you know, not necessarily meditation per se, but, you know, really taking some time just to take a break. And I'm, I like rowing. I don't know about you know, if you know what it is, but, you know, I go to a gym and I, and I row. And that's kind of, to me, it's like being on a rocking chair, except I'm on a row machine and I really totally decompress. So that's, that's what I do. <laughs> I, um, I do a lot of walking. I, I do 10,000 steps a day in addition to uh, 20 minutes on the treadmill at a faster rate. And, um, and that is very therapeutic for me walking. But the other thing that happened when I moved to Houston is I became a writer. And uh, I always, I love book. I love books. I love bookstores. I always wanted to be a writer, but I think being in the Northeast where everybody's a writer, I, I felt too intimidated to do that. And for some reason coming to Houston, I know it's sort of odd to say you came to Houston to become a writer, but that's in fact what happened to me. It's, it's a very um, uh, encouraging community and supportive community. And I started writing books and, and I find that for me, you know, because you know, both Mary Lane and I are interacting with people constantly, despite what preconceived notions you have about science, it's a very social profession. You have to interact with a lot of people to get stuff done. So the writing is, is my moments of solitude when I can just, you know, have that personal time and, and I love it. And it's, and, uh, and so I've, I'm working now on my fifth book since coming to uh, Houston. And, uh, and, and the only thing I missed during this pandemic is before when I would write, sometimes I would go to a cafe and, um, you know, have a coffee or a glass of wine. I'd go to, I, we live in Mantra, so I'd go to Cafe Brazil or, um, or Common Bon or Agora Cafe. And, and cause I, tend to do better when, when it's not totally quiet, when there's sort of people around doing things. So that's, 
I haven't done that as much during the pandemic, but that's what I look forward to uh, when things start to open up again. Well, we certainly hope you'll be able to get back to cafe, go into a cafe pretty soon. Thank you all for, for being here. Thank you for answering those last questions or for answering all of our questions. I just want to say that um, you all will forever be a part of our community now. So um, Dr. Hotez and Dr. Potazi, thank you so very much. We do have a gift for you. We will wear our KN95 masks or our N95 masks and come over there and present those to you as soon as we can. Um, and so we have that for you. We, we want to give those to you in person and we will at a later date. Thank you to everyone who's been here with us um, to enjoy this wonderful celebration. Take care. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. You're the best. And uh, we look forward to coming to, onto campus and meeting with the students and the faculty uh, in person. That would be something Fantastic. very, very yes. rewarding. We'll for hold us. you to it. Fantastic. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Have a good night.